Uh, so, uh, first of all, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending this addiction and gambling um, seminar. Uh, this is the, the, the third in a search 2021 seminar series. Uh, we've had previous seminars this year on women and alcohol and a conversation with uh, Dr. Gabor Mate uh, on addiction and trauma. Uh, and those uh, the recordings of those uh, events are available on a search website, which is assert.biz. Um, I'm sure I'm sure you'll agree that um, in terms of today's seminar, addiction and gambling, that's a particularly relevant uh, issue. Uh, gambling is more accessible than it ever has been uh, before, particularly online and through apps. Um, and it's hard, and certainly in my experience, to, to, to find a television channel in the evening where there isn't some form of uh, gambling site being advertised through or in, you know, sports gambling or, or casino gambling. And the inevitable consequence of that is that as more people are engaged in gambling, then more people develop problems with their gambling. And assert as a, a charity, which where our focus is alcohol and drugs, uh, we're certainly seeing that there are more people who are coming to our services who uh, are experiencing gambling issues alongside their alcohol or their uh, drug problems. And I think that's probably the case for a lot of frontline services. So today's uh, event is, is particularly relevant in that regard. I'm delighted to have uh, the, the three speakers who we have here uh, today uh, to be able to shed light uh, on this issue. So I want to welcome uh, Dr. Mark uh, Griffiths, um, Rachel uh, Hassan, or Ray, as she is also uh, commonly known, um, and uh, Pauline Campbell. Um, and uh, before we move into straight into the, the presentations, I'll just do, do um, some kind of housekeeping here so you understand what the format is. Um, so um, the way that this is going to work is that the, the first two speakers will, will, will do their presentations and, um, straight, one, straight after each other. And then we're going to have like a 10 minute break, just a comfort break for everyone so they can, you know, uh, take a comfort break or, or get a cup of tea or something. Um, and then that'll be followed by a question and answer. Um, uh, session for the panel. So the way that that works is that you'll see that there's a question and answer feature um, on your dashboard and uh, you can put questions in there uh, and you can also then like questions that someone else uh, puts in and that'll kind of, you know, those most popular kind of questions, what we'll do is I'll draw from some of those questions and put them to the panel so that they can uh, respond and discuss those things. Um, and we'll do that for the last kind of, you know, 40 minutes of the, of the, of the, the morning um, before we close. Um, just to, to say as a reminder that this is being recorded. Uh, so in terms of doing the putting questions into the, the question answer uh, feature, if you don't want your name to be known, because I may say who is asking the question, um, then just select it as anonymous or change your name uh, to anonymous in the I think people can't see you, um, you only see the panelists, um, but your name uh, will appear within the, the questions if you ask one. Okay, so um, move straight into the, the, the presentation. So first of all, I'd like to, uh, to welcome Dr. Mark Griffiths. Um, Mark is a distinguished professor of behavioral addiction at Nottingham at Trent University and is also director of the International Gaming, uh, Gaming Research Unit. So uh, Mark's a leading expert in the field um, and ha is, has, is widely published and has won numerous awards for his work um, around uh, gambling, gaming and behavioural addictions. So Mark, I'll just hand over to you. Thank you very much, Gary. Hopefully this is going to, to work. Um, Okay, can everyone see my screen? Sorry, is that a yes? Can people? Yes, yeah, Mark, that? all's good. Yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, so what I'm gonna talk about today is uh, gambling, alcohol use, addiction, and addictive personality. 
obviously I'm an academic and there will be a couple of slides where I kind of kind of go into academic mode but I'll try and keep it as as light and as brief um, as possible um, first thing I'm going to whoops um, this is one of my favorite quotes in the addiction literature it says that certain individuals use certain substances in certain ways thought at certain times to be unacceptable by certain other individuals for reasons both certain and uncertain and this is why I'll be in a job for life. I mean, any of us that work in the uh, addictive behaviours field know that addiction is a really complex issue. Uh, I've been studying uh, problem gambling for 34 years now, but my work has now taken me into things like video game addiction, internet um, addiction, sex addiction, work addiction, basically any addictions that don't involve the ingestion of a psychoactive substance. Now, when I first came into the field of addiction back in 1987, when I, was, when I started my PhD, there was actually very few what I would call uh, all encompassing um, definitions of uh, addiction. And I always tell my students, if you're going to use the word addiction, you've got to actually define what you mean in the first place. And I can be pretty sure that everybody at this, this webinar today is going to have a slightly different definition of what it is to be addicted to something. And I, I actually use a, a definition that dates back to 1988, which was actually after I started my PhD. And this definition says that addictive behavior is a repetitive habit pattern that increases the risk of disease and or associated personal or social problems, often experienced subjectively as a loss of control. And these habit patterns are typically characterized by immediate gratification, i.e. the short-term reward, often coupled with delayed deleterious effects, i.e. the long-term costs, and attempts to actually change an addictive behavior, either via treatment or by self-initiation, are typically marked by high relapse rates. And the reason I like this definition, it doesn't actually mention there anything about the ingestion of a psychoactive substance like alcohol, cocaine or heroin. What we've got here is an all encompassing definition that could be applied to things like gambling, video game playing, sex, work and exercise. Now for me, um, this next slide that I'm gonna go, um, sorry, not this next slide, uh, but before I talk about what I think is gonna be my most important slide I put up today, is one thing I always say about gambling addiction is for me, gambling addiction is what I call the breakthrough addiction. OK, it's now accepted in most psychiatric texts around the world. Uh, in 1980, pathological gambling was introduced by the American Psychiatric Association into their official diagnostic manual um, as a disorder of impulse control. But it actually wasn't until May 2013 is that gambling and it's now been called gambling disorder rather than pathological gambling, was actually uh, called an addiction for the first time by the American Psychiatric Association and also the World Health Organization in terms of their um, diagnostic text. They also see uh, gambling in its most excessive form as a genuine addiction. And if you take that basic premise that gambling in its most excessive forms can be an addic a true addictive behavior, just like being addicted to alcohol or addicted to nicotine or addicted to other harder drugs, then there's actually no theoretical reason why people can't be addicted to other things. And of course, that is what I've spent my whole career doing is look at, looking at these other types of, of pot uh, potentially addictive behavior of which gambling is the one I've been studying longest, nearly 35 years now. So in terms of what, um, what I want to talk about, this, this is probably going to be the most important slide I put up from my perspective. Because, um, you know, for me, when I talk about addiction is that addiction is something that comprises six key elements. And for me, I don't define anything as an addictive behavior unless all of these six elements are there. And these six elements are what we call salience, mood modification, tolerance, withdrawal, conflict and relapse. Now, salience basically means that this is the single most important thing in my life. Here is an activity that I'll do to neglect of everything in my life. And I'm gonna just give you uh, an example of three quotes from three real gamblers, okay? Just to give you an idea of what I really think salience is all about. Uh, this first one is from a guy that I've called Tony and said, Tony said, if I wasn't actually gambling, I was spending the rest of my time working out clever little schemes to obtain money to feed my habit. These two activities literally took up all my time. So here we've got a situation that if you're not actually engaged in the activity, you're thinking about the next time I'm going to do the activity or here thinking about how am I going to get money to actually engage in the thing I really want to do. Uh, the second quote is from a guy that I've called Brian and Brian said, gamble, gamble, gamble your life away. You might as well have put it down the drain. 
you've got to face the truth and you're having a love affair and it's with a machine whose lights flash takes your money and kills your soul and for me the probably the best example of salience i could give you is from a guy that i've called david okay david is somebody i knew for many many years and david said that during four or five years of compulsive gambling I think I missed about six or seven days of playing fruit machines, keeping in the mind about four or five of those days were Christmas days where it was impossible to gain access to a gambling machine. As you've probably gathered, I ate, slept and breathed gambling machines. I couldn't even find time to spend with the people I loved. The machines were more important than anything or anyone else. Now, for me, this is a really strong quote. You can take out the word fruit machine there and put in the word heroin or alcohol or whatever you want to do. Because what we're talking about here is a behavior that has completely taken over somebody's life. This was a guy who ended up in prison as a result of acquisitive crime to feed his fruit machine addiction. OK, this was something, you know, basically in his house, if it wasn't nailed down, he would basically stick, you know, sell it just so he could he could fund his fruit machine addiction. Now, obviously, this is a very extreme case. But I always argue if you accept that David here is somebody who is genuinely addicted to slot machines in the same way that other people are addicted to things like alcohol, cocaine or heroin, is that what we're saying here is that it is possible for people to be genuinely addicted to an actual behavior that doesn't involve the ingestion of a psychoactive substance. Now, uh, uh, I just want to mention for those, I mean, my guess is that a lot of people who are listening on this webinar, they come from a drug and alcohol background and they might be saying to themselves hang on a minute mark a lot of my clients they don't think about alcohol all the time uh, and in a way you're right because when when we talk about drug addictions or addictions that involve the ingestion of a psychoactive substance is because people can actually engage in these behaviors simultaneously alongside doing other things they actually don't realize that this behavior is salient until that that particular um, substance is taken away from or they're unable to engage with it so for instance if you're a nicotine addict and you're suddenly on a 24-hour plane fl plane flight to new zealand suddenly is that nicotine cigarettes do suddenly become the single most important thing in that person's life because you're you're stopped from engaging in your behavior of choice and that is why uh, we can have what i would call um, pathological alcohol gamb uh, alcoholic gamblers so people who are both addicted to both alcohol and gambling you know, because you can, if you want to, is obviously drink alcohol while you're while you're playing on a slot machine. It's actually much harder to have what I call two concurrent behavioral addictions occurring together. For me, it's actually very diff difficult for me to say you could be uh, uh, addicted to gambling and addicted to work because one of those activities is bound to take over all your life. So unless you're a professional gambler, is that it's pretty hard to be both addicted to gambling and work at, at the same time. So I actually introduced a concept called reverse salience, which applies to drug addictions only, which basically says is that this, is, this activity is definitely the most salient, salient activity in this person's life, but they never realize how salient into it is until they are prevented from engaging in that, that particular um, psychoactive substance. So going back to my addiction, what I call my addiction components model, so that's salience. And ne the next um, key thing for me is mood modification, is that people use drugs or, or addictive substances as a way of either, um, either getting buzzed up high, aroused, excited, or to do the exact opposite, to tranquilize, to escape, to numb, to relax and to de-stress. But, you know, for me, all addictions have to involve what I call mood modification, this idea that this behavior or this substance can give you reliable and consistent shifts in your mood state. We also know is that most genuine addictions is that build, people build up, build up tolerance. So over time, what we see in gambling is people gambling for longer and longer periods, gambling with bigger and bigger bet sizes. If you're an alcoholic, is that you will actually drink more and more. You know, you might start off drinking, you know, for an hour or two a day and suddenly you're drinking bottles of whiskey a day right through, um, you know, your waking hours. And the fourth component is what we call withdrawal sy symptoms. So again, even though I work in the, the area of behavioral addiction, is I can tell you now, people who are genuinely addicted to gambling will have both psychological and physiological withdrawal symptoms. On a psychological level, if a gambler who's got a problem with it is, is stopped from gambling on a psychological level, they will feel more, mood, more moody, more irritable, more frustrated. But also on a physiological level, Pathological gamblers who, who cannot gamble for whatever reason is that they will have stomach cramps, nausea, hand sweats, 
uh, panic attack. So what we've got here are genuine withdrawal symptoms, even though it doesn't involve the ingestion of a psychoactive substance. And the most important uh, component of addiction for me is the fifth one here, conflict. Because what we're talking about here is an act, you know, an activity that's so conflicting in this person's life, they will do it to the neglect of everything else. It compromises their personal relationships. It compromises their job or schoolwork, college work, university work, depending on what age you are. These people also experience what I call intrapsychic conflict, conflict within themselves. They know that they're doing this activity too much. They know that they should probably try and cut down and stop, but they feel unable to do so. And they experience a subjective loss of control. And I always get asked the question, particularly in relation to my work on things like addictive video game playing and addictive online use, is what's the difference between a healthy enthusiasm to something and something that's a genuine addiction? And for me, I've got a very simple rule of thumb is that, you know, healthy, you know, healthy, excessive enthusiasms, even if they take up a lot of time, is that they add to life, whereas addictions tend to take away from it. And on that very simple rule of thumb, very few people, you know, in terms of the behaviours that I research, are actually genuinely addicted to these behaviours. And, you know, most people can actually, even if they're engaged excessively in, in these activities, are not necessarily having any problems with it at all. And then the final component of my six components is relapse. And, you know, what we will know is that if you are genuinely addicted to something and you give up for two days, two weeks, two months or even two years, is that when you start engaging the activity again, you go straight back into the addictive cycles you, you were in before. And so for me, you know, the Mark Twain, the American author, has got a lovely quote about giving up smoking. He said, giving up smoking is really easy to do. I've done it hundreds of times. And again, for me, you know, smoking is the classic relapse behavior, but we also find it in th obviously the things like alcohol, you know, alcohol uh, use and, and problems with alcohol, but also gambling addictions as well. So for me, the argument I'm trying to make here is that I personally do not define any, you know, any behavior as an, a genuine addiction unless the person actually has and can and demonstrate all six of these components. Let's you know, the argument is if they've, they've got five of these rather than six, then I would probably say that this that person is, you know, if this, if this referred to gambling, that they're a problem gambler rather than necessarily being addicted, which does mean that I'm quite hardline when it comes to, you know, the defining of addictive behavior. But as I say, any behavior that we define, if we say gambling disorder, gambling addiction, problem gambling, we have to have a definition of what, what it actually means there. Now, the other thing that I ought to point out when I talk about addictive behaviors is that addictive behaviors for me are really a combination of three sets of, of factors that interact with each other. We've got what we call the individual characteristics. So for a gambler, it would be their individual personality characteristics, biological or genetic predispositions, their attitudes uh, towards gambling, their expectations, their beliefs, basically everything that's internal to the gambler. Okay, and you know, the vast majority of research on gambling has looked at these individual characteristics. It's almost want to say, that the problem resides within the individual. But in fact, I've done most of my career has actually looked at these other two things, what we call the structural and situational characteristics. So structural characteristics are the things that are inherent within the gambling activity itself. So how, for instance, are slot machines designed as a way to make you spend more and more money? And there are what we call the situational characteristics. And at a macro level, this would be things like advertising, marketing, where do I place my product? But they're also what we call micro situational characteristics. When I walk into a casino, you know, what are the colors in there? What are the lights, the sounds, the noise? Is there an ATM machine on the floor? Are they serving free alcohol? It's everything within a micro environment that, again, might actually um, impact on the acquisition, development and maintenance uh, of gambling behavior. But for me, when I talk about um, the addictiveness of, of a particular gambling product, I do come back to what we call the structural characteristics. So even though we know there are certain people that have predispositions in terms of personality predispositions or biological and genetic predispositions, we know that there are some forms of gambling that have a much, much higher association with problem gambling than other activities. So for instance, I personally have never ever met anybody addicted to a bi-weekly lotto game. You cannot become addicted to something where you only find out the reward on a Wednesday night and on a, on a Saturday night. However, something like a slot machine where you can gamble in a pub slot machine 10 to 12 times a minute, or you go onto some of the online slot machines where you can gamble 30 or 40 times a minute. 
Okay, what we what that what I'm describing there is you know a, what we call a very high event frequency. Basically, there is a big association between gambling activities that have high event frequencies and you know what with you know gambling activities that have very low event frequencies don't tend to be problematic. Yes, you could spend lots of money on it, but they don't tend to be problematic. So, for instance, you might be thinking, so what you're telling us, Mark, is that slot machines are addictive and lotteries aren't. But of course, I'm not because I could I could create a very addictive lottery product and how I would do that instead of having the draw once on a Wednesday night and once on a Saturday night, I'll have the draw every two minutes. And I can guarantee people would have, you know, some people would develop problems to that type of activity. And I'm not being facetious there because that game does exist. It's a game called Kino and we find this in other countries. So there are automated draws, lot, you know, big lotto games where the, the lottery draw is every couple of minutes. I could also create you the single safest slot machine. So instead of um, being able to, to, to gamble on a slot machine 10 or 12 times a minute, when you come to play on my slot machine, I'm only going to let you press the button or pull the lever once on a Wednesday night and once on a Saturday night. And I guarantee no one will ever become addicted to that slot machine. Also, I will lose a lot of money because nobody will play that slot machine. But what I'm trying to argue here is that the individual structural characteristics within so things like the jackpot size the stake size event frequency what we call the psychology of the near miss there are lots and lots of things that, that are designed within within gambling products that get get people gambling again and again and again now when it comes to um uh, gambling and alcohol for instance um these are these we know that these two activities often are comorbid with each other and we know that problem gambling is often comorbid with lots of different psychological and psychiatric um, disorders. Uh, we also know that you know comorbid disorder, disorders they can exacerbate each other. So you know if you are a problem gambler, is that that can exacerbate things like depression or anxiety and vice versa. And there are many studies over the past three decades, very, you know, demonstrating a very very strong relationship between problem gambling and psychiatric comorbidity, particularly depression uh, and anxiety. Um, in terms of some of the, the, the literature out, out there, I've just, you know, the next couple of slides come from a book chapter that is, is just about to come out, where I've got a whole section there looking at the comorbidity between gambling, alcohol and other um, psychoactive uh, substance use. So we know, for instance, uh, among older adolescents is that the occurrence of, of problem gambling and heavy use of alcohol and illicit drugs, based on the studies that are being done, is anywhere between about a third of problem gamblers up to nearly 60%. In small scale studies, what we, we tend to find is that um, the results of, of people who are problem gamblers is that between four uh, to 11 and a half percent of people uh, have alcoholism. Uh, one major study that was done in the UK, sorry, in the US, a very large study showed that of people that were ringing into a gambling helpline is there is that 18 percent of those helpline callers were reporting problem alcohol use as well. We know from some of the large scale uh, uh, studies that have been done uh, across Europe is that uh, between 14 to 36 percent in Europe and 25 percent to 33 percent of problem gamblers report alcohol abuse or dependence. And we know that drinking alcohol is the most common substance used by people with gambling problems. There is a, you know, a large comorbidity between these two particular behaviours. And the review that I was just talking about is that in this review, uh, we actually broke it down into lots of, of different groups. OK, and what we find is that, you know, if you're a pathological gambler, you have a much higher um, uh, prevalence and incidence of um, alcohol, uh, problematic alcohol use compared with the, uh, the normal population. This is the same for other groups. If you look, so, for instance, treatment seeking uh, pathological gamblers, alcohol dependent patients have a, a higher prevalence of problem gambling than the, 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 the kind of national norms. And for those who don't know, here in the UK, the national gambling problem rate in this country at the moment is around about half a percent, which obviously still translates to tens of thousands of people. But quite interestingly, even though we've, for instance, seen a 600 percent increase in advertising, is that the actual prevalence of problem gambling has been pretty static at around about half a percent now for the last 20 years. We did have a slight blip back in 2011, uh, uh, but now we've, you know, in terms of the latest, either the Gambling Commission figures or the Psychiatric Morbidity uh, Survey, is that it's around about 0.5% uh, of people in this country have a problem gambling, uh, a problem with their gambling. But as I say, there are other target groups 
and other population groups to where we know there is a higher preponderance of both alcohol use disorder and problem gambling. So for instance, psychiatric outpatients, casino employees, military personnel. We know that studies that have looked at adolescents, young adults, and even elderly gamblers, we found that the, you know, the, the comorbidity between alcohol use disorder and problem gambling is also there in the, those groups. And also we've seen you know, groups like Native Americans and you know, lots of, you know, I, I can't think of a single regional or national epidemiological study that's ever been done, obviously including those here in the UK, that hasn't found a higher proportion of people with alcohol problems amongst those that have gambling problems as well. Uh, we've just published two very recent studies here in the UK, and uh, th these two studies uh, from the same data set, but this is a longitudinal study where we've been following people for over 15 years now in terms of their, their gambling and other behaviors. In the, in the first study that we published where we were just looking at regular gambling, what we found was that one of the predictors um, of problematic, uh, sorry, one of the associations uh, with regular gambling was having problematic alcohol use. And the study on the right there, where we looked specifically at problem gambling in and of itself, interestingly, one of the major things that came through there, because this is a longitudinal study, one of the things we found that if you were a problem gambler at the age of 20, it was actually a predicting factor to, be, uh, to have alcohol use disorder at the age of 24. So even though the gambling might have actually calmed down and almost spontaneously remitted is that, you know, that if you're a problem gambler earlier in your life, you are more likely to be a problem drinker later in your life. Um, this next slide, and I'm sorry, this is, is quite small. I don't want to spend ages on this slide, but back in 2011, uh, we did a, a really quite massive study where we looked at the comorbidity between 11 different types of addictive behavior. Uh, and what we found, and this was mainly using a, a large scale Amer uh, American surveys, but we did you know, bring in other countries as and when, particularly if there, there wasn't the, the, you know, the, the kind of literature base there. But what we actually found here is that when we looked at the comorbidity between gambling and other types of addictive behaviors, what we found was that approximately 50% uh, approximately of problem gamblers were dependent on uh, cigarettes that around 30% uh, of problem gamblers were dependent on alcohol and around 20% of problem gamblers were dependent on drugs. So we do see this comorbidity between not just alcohol, but other types of, of psychoactive substance between uh, gambling and, and these, these other types of behavior. And what I want to just kind of end with today, and I know I'm doing a kind of whistle bang, bang tour here because um, you know, I, I, I just wanna pick out some of the things that are personally interesting to me. Uh, but I want to talk briefly about the addiction, that, about the concept of addictive personality, because I think a lot of people, uh, particularly addicts themselves, will, will actually say to themselves, you know, I've got an addictive personality. That's why I have problems with drink, why I have problems with, with gambling, why I have problems with sex or whatever the particular behavior happens to be. Now, I come from a perspective where I actually don't believe in the concept of addictive personality at all. OK, I, I wrote a very populist piece back in um, 2016 for the conversation and then lots and lots of newspapers re, 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 you know, basically um, printed the story again. So in The Independent, Daily Mail, etc. And then I wrote a more academic paper just called simply called The Myth of Addictive Personality. And there'll be, you know, and I know there'll be people listening to this who will be, you know, um, absolutely in disagreement with this, who passionately believe in the concept of addictive personality. And I think if you look at, you know, what is it and why is it that people believe in the con you know, concept of addictive personality? Well, I think there are two main reasons for that is that we know that, you know, we, you know, and I know it from my own research is that some addicts we know are addicted to more than one thing. And we often get this comorbidity being to being addicted to a substance and being addicted to a behavior at the same time. So people, as I say, if you're an alcoholic pathological gambler, is you might say, you know, I've got an addictive personality. That's why I've got, I'm addicted to both of, both of these activity. We also know is that when people give up one form of addictive behavior, it often leaves what I call a big hole, a big void. And often the only way that people can fill that big void is to actually substitute it with another addictive behavior. And that's what we psychologists call reciprocity. They say, you know, when I walk into a group of, of Gamblers Anonymous, it used to be the case that I'd walk into a group of chain smoking, coffee addicted individuals. You know, they've almost swapped one addiction um, with another. 
And, you know, I don't dispute either of these two things. We know that these cross addictions and comorbidities occur and we know reciprocity um, is there. But, you know, when you talk about addictive personality is, you know, and I have to say, and I say this to my students all the time, is that you have to have a definition of what it is to be these things. So, when, you know, when we talk about uh, addictive personality, I, I came up with a definition uh, back in 2017 and said that addictive personality is a cognitive and behavioral style which is both specific and personal that renders an individual vulnerable to acquiring and maintaining one or more addictive behaviors at any one time. And by actually using this, this particular definition, very few people would ever fulfill that definition. You know, and the, you know people ask me, Mark, why do, I, do not, why do I not believe in the concept of addictive personality? And I have to go back to a very, inf and th this is probably the most academic slide that I'll put up today. But a guy called Peter Nathan uh, published a paper way back in 1988. And he said that if we're going to, you know, if we're going to use this term addictive personality, we have to have standards of proof to definitively show there are links between a person's personality and addictive behavior. And he said that if, if, if this addictive personality trait actually exists, then it has to either precede the initial signs of that addictive disorder or must be a direct and lasting feature of that addictive disorder. It must be specific to the addictive disorder rather than being antecedent, coincident or consequent to other disorders or behaviours that often accompany addictive behaviour. It must be discriminative. So, you know, if you've got this trait, OK, it must be identifying addiction and addiction alone. And then finally said it must be related to the addictive behaviour on the basis of independently confirmed empirical rather than clinical evidence. Now, I personally, I disagree with that last one. I do think that, you know, if you've got clinical evidence that these things exist, then, you know, we should use that, that information. Now, again, some of you listening to this might have heard what, what is called the big five personality traits. OK, this is often known by two acronyms, either ocean or canoe. And what we, we, we find in nearly all addictive behaviours, there are two particular um, um, of these big, big five personality traits that have a high association with addictive behaviour. And these are conscientiousness, particularly low conscientiousness and um, high neuroticism. OK, so what we find, whether it's alcohol problems or whether it's gambling problems, is that what we tend to find is that these people score very low on conscientiousness. And a low conscientious person is somebody who is very impulsive, careless and disorganized. And people who score very high on, for neuroticism, you know, so, the, you know, these people are, are usually highly anxious. This is a very, very consistent finding in the literature so if we look at you know and obviously i normally when i do this as a lecture i normally do it for two hours with my students so really i'm just cherry picking things here but when we talk about addictive personality there are quite clear some you know some very common findings that we find in the field so for instance when we use standardized personality personality tests like the california personality inventory or the minnesota multiphasic personality inventory is that on, on things like the depression or the psychopathic deviate scale is that addicts tend to score very highly on this. And as I've just told you is amongst the big five personality traits is that high neuroticism and low conscientiousness comes through time and time again with almost every addictive behavior that I can think of. So we know that there are these consistent findings, but it's very hard to establish whether these, you know, whether it's the personality type that predicts the addictive behavior or whether the addictive behavior almost kind of turns you into that personality type and you know are these common findings really a pointer towards a very specific addictive personality well i can tell you from my research not every addict has a personality disorder and not every person with a personality disorder has an addiction and we do know there are obviously some personality disorders that have a, a very high association with problem gambling and uh, you know alcohol use for, as well. So things like antisocial personality disorder and borderline personality disorder. But the thing I would say is that just because a person has some of these personality traits of addiction, it doesn't mean that they will or are uh, become an addict. So you know, so when I you know from a practical point of view, you know when I talk to practitioners about you know th these kind of predisposing personality traits, what I would say that these are warning signs. And that's all they are. They're warning signs. And there is, as far as I'm concerned, there is no personality trait that guarantees addiction. So even if we find, for instance, that 100 percent of all problem gamblers are neurotic, if I can show you people that are neurotic but don't have a, a gambling problem, 
then it's not specific to gambling addiction. And that's what I mean about this idea that there is no evidence that there is an addictive personality trait that predicts addiction and addiction alone. So in short, for me, there is actually no evidence at all that there is th this thing called an addictive personality. But I do want to admit there are definitely predispositions that make some people more uh, susceptible and vulnerable to developing gambling problems, alcohol problems and other types of addiction. Uh, but I wouldn't call that an addictive personality. And again, one of my uh, uh, quotes from a, a woman who wrote a book, uh, Anna Salovitz, back in 2016. And she said that fundamental, fundamentally, the idea of a general addictive personality is a myth. Research finds no universal character traits that are common to all addicted people. Uh, only half have more than one addiction, if you take away cigarettes, and many can control their engagement with some addictive substances or activities, but not others. And only 18% of addicts, for example, have a personality disorder. This is actually four times the more higher than the rate we've seen in typical people, but it still means that 82% of us don't actually fit a particular caricature of addiction. And to conclude, so what I've actually tried to do in the short time I've been talking here is I've tried to argue is that behavioral addictions like gambling can and do exist, but obviously it depends on how you define addiction in the first place. The second thing I've tried to say is that addiction doesn't just reside within the individual. There are these situations and structural characteristics that are structural characteristics that manufacturers design into their products. You know, alcohol has a certain toxicity in terms of, you know, the percentage proof. So we know that drinking whiskey that is, you know, 30 percent proof is probably going to cause you more problems than a beer or a wine that might actually only have to be 5 percent proof. The things I was talking about in terms of gambling, the event frequency, that is very related to the toxicity that we find in, in, in psychoactive substances. I've also uh, tried to argue that you know, addiction, uh, comorbidity is very commonplace. And that when we see, when we talk about gambling is that alcohol problems very much go hand in hand with problem gambling. And the final thing I did try to do, and I knew, realized this was a more controversial thing, I tried to argue today that addictive personality doesn't exist. And so I'll say thank you very much, and I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you, Mark. That was a very uh, interesting presentation. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure it's um, some, some of them are challenging too. Um, the, the, uh, if people have uh, questions uh, or, or uh, ideas that have come out of uh, listening to that uh, contribution, then please put them into the, the question and answer. Um, a feature we'll be able to discuss them later on. Uh, so thank you. Uh, I'll move straight on to uh, uh, Ray Hassan, who is the uh, Director of Quality Innovation with GAMCARS, Gam uh, a leading charity uh, providing support to people with uh, gambling uh, problems. Uh, and uh, Rachel, or Ray, uh, has spent 20 years uh, working on frontline services dealing with issues like um, addiction, and homelessness uh, and sex working, uh, and has been with uh, GAMCAR for the last uh, two years as as, uh, as a director on the senior management team. So I'll just hand over to you, uh, Ray, thank you. Yes, I'm just gonna try and share my screen. Okay, so um, I'm gonna jump straight in and try and catch a bit of time back for everybody. Um, First slide for me is looking at what um, what do we mean by gambling? So I'm not coming from an academic place as Mark has just done. I'm going to be a bit more practical with you guys and looking at how you can look at this within your working context. Um, so gambling. So what we mean by the activity of gambling is somebody that takes um, a stake or risks money on anything um, of value um, on the outcome of something that is involved in chance. So that's the basic term that we're looking at when we talk about what gambling is as an, as an activity. Problematic gambling, we then talk about it in the context of something that disrupts or compromises or damages something around your family employment or personal or recreational pursuits. So um, this is when gambling is having an impact on your ability to engage. We then look at gambling related harms. Now this is where GAMCARE's work predominantly sits. 
So we look at the adverse impacts from gambling on somebody's health and well-being, and that is for the individual, their families and community society around them. I'm now going to look at kind of gambling harms, uh, gambling related harms specifically, and this tends to kind of um, circle around three main areas. And we look at it in terms of resources and the impacts that people report around the resources. So uh, people report about taking loans and um, having uh, second mortgages, homelessness, um, coerced into taking more debt than they can afford, unpaid bills and, and general debt as a result of their gambling. Uh, other things that tend to be reported are things like um, uh, repossessions and evictions, uh, loss of savings, uh, gambling on credit, which is a big thing at the moment, and payday loans and employment. Also some criminal activity around theft and fraud. And when we talk about economic abuse, that tends to be within the family domain, that, um, which um, are affected others. We work with both problem gamblers and affected others, tend to report a lot in terms of uh, a family member who is gambling and the impact that is on the family and their um, general resources. Um, just sticking on that theme of, of kind of affected others as well, in terms of relationships, we get a lot of um, reports around how that impacts on, on how gambling behaviours um, impact on relationships. Um, it tends to be around poor performance at work, uh, people are sidetracked, not thinking, um, thinking a lot about the gambling behaviours. Uh, within our young people services, there is a lot of reports around child to parent violence and uh, family breakdowns. Uh, during the COVID period, we also on our helplines had a lot of uh, reports around uh, an increase of domestic abuse uh, that was uh, becoming more apparent and um, physical and emotional neglect within the family um, around those relationships. Um, health is another big area. People report a lot of um, issues around health. Uh, we're seeing an increase in uh, mental health and particularly uh, poor mental health, a lot of suicidal thoughts and actions being reported on our helpline and within our treatment services. Um, the links to drugs and alcohol, uh, mainly alcohol, we're getting a lot of reports around uh, increased alcohol use um, and uh, associated um, health implications as a result of that. Um, and uh, past and, and, and current traumas that are being kind of raised as a result and a lot of anxiety, depression and, and chronic stress as a result of the gambling behaviours and the impacts that it's having on the resource and relationships. So we tend to look at gambling um, on a continuum, um, very similar, I think, to how um, it, is, it, it is looked at in drugs and alcohol services. Uh, we have a, a similar way of um, working with um, that continuum as well in terms of the interventions we provide. So we tend to have uh, interventions in tiers uh, where we have tier one as brief interventions, which are brief advice, information sharing, um, a, a little, a, a prevention work going on in, in tier one. Tier two, we look at um, extended brief interventions, uh, things, practical applications of, of things. And then tier three, more structured treatment that um, really uh, is around psychosocial interventions and mainly CBT type interventions within um, a structured uh, appointment setting. So when we look at the gambling continuum, uh, on one end of that, when people, when we look at those that are in control, um, it's more occasional gambling. Uh, it's more in an entertainment, ten, entertainment content, uh, gambling with others, and sticking to spending limits, sticking to um, having a flutter, as people may say, on various gambling activity, but not to the point where it's having an impact. We then start going up the continuum to look at where the increased risks start to come into play. And what that tends to present in is more frequent uh, diversifying in the, in the nature of gambling. So some people may gamble in land-based um, activities, some online, some a different type. Some may bet on the horses or the football. Some may use casinos and, you know, um, online bingo and casino um, uh, activities. So therefore, kind of, you see people start to take different um, gambling types and start adding those different gambling activities in. 
there's a lot more around chasing losses of, of, of gambling, previous gambling behaviours and, and, and where they move from control and, and sticking to those spending limits to kind of trying to win back some losses that they've experienced. Um, concealment is a big thing uh, when you start to look at risks. When people are not talking about what is happening in their behaviours and what the impacts are and starting to hide a lot, that becomes a bit more of a, a risky behaviour. And um, difficulty in concentrating on other things, um, and, but then being a bit more isolated with the concealment of not sharing what is going on, um, tending to hide more, it becomes more isolated in its behaviour and, and more risky to the person. And then at the other end of that continuum, we look at um, problematic and uh, where things are starting to uh, impact a bit more severely. So there may be more borrowing of money, more criminality, uh, criminal behaviour going on to, to kind of recoup money to be able to continue to gamble. Um, relationships both at work and home starting to suffer and the mental health is starting to really have an impact and we're getting more reports around those suicidal thoughts. So I wanted to share with you what some of that looks like in terms of the activity data that we have across our helpline and treatment services. So just to look at um, on our helpline, we are looking at target calls and what we call target calls are callers that come into the national helpline um, specifically around their gambling behaviour. We do get calls from people who are calling thinking it's a different helpline or even some people call in for the lottery numbers, for example, and not necessarily for gambling interventions. So we spil uh, filter those types of calls out and to be able to get the um, true data set that we need to look at target calls. People who are calling specifically around their gambling behaviours. So just looking at that over time, for over the last three years, from 2018 going through to 2021, um, this, is, this chart is demonstrating the number of helpline calls and the number of chats and the number of outbound calls. Now, an, out, an outbound call is a call where somebody is called into the helpline and we've called them back. They've either requested a call back or we've had to call back because we're doing a welfare check of some kind. Um, so as you can see, um, similar to what Mark was saying, it's, pre it's pretty static in terms of the numbers over, over um, the periods. Um, but what we're seeing is around 25,000 unique callers to the helpline each year. And when we, call, when we say unique callers, these are callers that have only called for the first time in any given period. We do have callers that are repeat callers, so the number of calls to the helpline is a lot higher than that. Um, but uh, we again, we filter out the data to be able to look at those callers who um, call uh, the helpline on a number of occasions and those callers that are calling for the first time in the year on year data. Um, I thought I would share some uh, interesting data around uh, COVID and the impact COVID um, has had um, on, on our helpline um, because it's an interesting time, I think, for, for all of us, actually. And um, just blocking out the dates across the COVID lockdown. So if you see in the first bit, you've got the first lockdown, which was between Mar March and June 2020. And the blue line is the calls and the orange is the chats. And what we see in that data is that, um, and this is for the first time actually across our data set over the last five years, we saw the calls dramatically decrease and the chats increase um, over that period. Um, we, in, in kind of unpicking that a bit with, with the people that call in, um, predominantly their reasons for using chat functionality rather than calling and speaking to advisor on the lines was confidentiality not being able to be in a space at home because of lockdown where they were um, able to speak on the phone. So chat became more of the mechanism to have um, some input from somebody. Um, and I think that speaks to my previous slide of when we talk about people concealing um, some of their behaviours and not um, sharing that with family members and, and seeking support um, within that, um, uh, within the family, that that um, is present in our data that people tend to want to resort to chat rather than calls to maintain that confidentiality. So going into the second lockdown and third lockdown, again, this data is a bit patchy because across the country, as you all know, the lockdowns uh, presented themselves in different ways at different times uh, across the country, but we've kind of cohorted it into the main bulks of when the national lockdowns took place. And again, in the second lockdown in November, um, we saw the, the changeover from calls to chats, and again, in the third lockdown. 
the same the same presented. So what else changed during this period? Um, so if this is now looking at our data for those that gamble and, and, and presented um, reported, sorry, gambling offline. Um, so offline activities, so that's your land based activities, um, your things that are not on, on the online um, uh, uh, platforms and then those that reported mainly gambling activity that was online. And as you can see on our year on year data over the last three years, we steadily saw a kind of change anyway from people being more offline in their gambling um, activity um, to becoming more online in their gambling activity. And I think in this last year of 2020, 2021, um, with it going up to 84% um, reporting online activity, um, that swing um, potentially was, was, was tipped over by the COVID um, situation. But I think generally it was gradually moving towards um, more online anyway before that. So um, looking at the top five reasons why people uh, report uh, in, into our lines that they gamble and they haven't changed actually over, over the period and haven't changed for the last four or five years. So the main reports that we get are um, chasing losses and wins, financial difficulties. We thought that during COVID, we might get a switch where people might say that they're gambling more because, uh, for boredom or escapism, um, but that didn't happen actually. And people continuously uh, to continue to report that the, the main two for them were chasing losses and financial difficulties as their reasons for gambling. Um, I thought I'd share with you on here some of our demographic data because again, I think this is quite interesting to look at the cohorts we're currently reaching out to and those that predominantly we're not reaching out to in our, in our, our services at the moment. So um, within the gender breakdown, it heavily tells us that those that are affected others predominantly are women and those that are gamblers are predominantly male. Um, we do do some focused work at the moment. We have a women's programme that we are trying to target, particularly women engaging in services. There are uh, particular reasons why women don't tend to engage in services, which I'll, I'll go through a bit later. Um, but from in terms of our um, split on that, that's predominantly what we see. Females are uh, mainly reporting as affected others and males as, as gamblers. In terms of the ethnicity breakdown, in both cohorts, uh, gambler and affected other, 89% there are white British. Um, um, and then we go into the next um, ethnicity group or, or the next highest ethnicity group being Asian with gambler at 5% and affected other at 4%. Um, and I think, you know, this is somewhere that is a, a real interest to me in terms of how we reach out to a wider cohort. Um, of people because I don't necessarily believe that gambling is specific to these ethnic groups. I think um, we may need to do things differently to look at how we can reach out to um, a broader uh, range of people and um, I think that needs uh, some work and, and working with our partners to do that is something that we're, we're looking at doing uh, in the coming months. So uh, looking at projects around underserved groups um, and looking at projects where we can work with local services um, to be able to try and get underneath that and um, reach out to people that wouldn't ordinarily come into services um, for gambling. And then when we look at the age breakdown, again, the cohort tends to be cl clustered in the 26 to 35 and 36 to 45 age range. And again, that is for both gambler and affected other in those cohorts. So we kind of know the demographics that we're currently reaching. We know um, the, the amount of people that are coming into services. And I think it's about now using the data to inform our practice as we move forward to be able to do some interventions to targeted groups that we may not be reaching at the moment. So um, looking at the gambling impacts. So um, again, I've highlighted the kind of top four things that tend to come through a lot, both within our helpline and our treatment services. So mental health is one of the key things that um, is commonly um, presented. A lot of anxiety and stress uh, are reported by um, gamblers 
and affected others across both our helpline and our treatment services. Um, and what we're seeing and, 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 and coming through a bit more is a, a lot more suicidal thoughts um, reported. Um, we still need to kind of look at how we, um, how we use, again, our evidence, use our data to inform our practice as we move forward. Um, I think within gambling, what we're experiencing is that people tend to um, come into services at a much later stage of, of, of where, where things are um, a bit more impactful, where things are a bit more, um, you know, at, at that continuing end of, of, of risk and problematic. Um, so trying to look at how we get in a bit earlier, how we can do more education, more prevention work to um, reduce some of those risks uh, at the other end of the, of the continuum. Um, financial impacts, uh, again, is highlighted as one of the main concerns for people. Um, and the, uh, it's 75% of gamblers calling the helpline are uh, reporting financial difficulties. Um, and that goes up to 80% when they go into treatment services. Uh, family and relationship difficulties, again, um, not surprisingly that that is reported more in the affected other cohort. So our affected others um, really speak a lot of um, the family and relationship difficulties, which is interesting because within our gamblers uh, cohort, they tend to see it as their problem. That's not affecting anybody else but them. Um, so they, the, the numbers there, you know, 49% of gamblers identified, um, whereas uh, it was a much higher cohort of 81% in terms of the affected others. And, and I think there's some very similar in drugs and alcohol uh, work that you do that, um, you know, those that are, are, are in those behaviours tend to see it as affecting them and they don't see the impact of that behaviour on others around them. So a lot of the work is looking at how, how, we, how we do that with our service users. Um, and alcohol and drugs, in our data, it's showing over one in 10 gamblers attending treatment services are reporting alcohol misuse um, equally at the, same, at the same time. So a lot of the work that we're trying to do is reaching out to services who are working uh, with drugs and alcohol um, and trying to look at how we do more care coordination, how we do more joint working so that we're supporting them holistically and not just within one of those disciplines, but we're looking at how we do that across the board. So um, on our helpline, I uh, just want to highlight for those of you that may not know what uh, about GAMCARE and the work that GAMCARE does and what our helpline does. So our helpline is um, a 24-7 uh, service. Uh, we are open always. Um, and we take calls from all over the country, including Northern Ireland. Uh, we, in the initial bit of the contact on the helpline, we provide mainly practical support. So we have something uh, called the gambling triangle where we look at things like access to gambling, we look at time and we look at money. And in those three areas, access, we look at blocking software and self-exclusion tools. So uh, we currently run a, 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 a activity called Talk Band Stop. You may have seen some of the promotional material around that, uh, where we're working with the blocking software agents to be able to provide that for free if, if to anybody who calls into the helpline. And that's something that um, can be applied to somebody so that they do not get access to gambling um, operators sites. Um, and it's a self-exclusion that they choose to exclude from being able to have these, this access. And it just offers a bit of control back, if you like, for them to be able to um, apply that and, 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 and be able to use that as a, a, a harm reduction type tool. We then have time. Time is a big thing. We, took, we explore meaningful use of time, exploring alternatives to gambling. What else can um, they get involved in? What may they have let go of as a result of their gambling that can come back into play? Um, so those are kind of the things that we explore um, to be able to encourage people to divert some activity from gambling back to other things that they may enjoy. And then money, obviously, in that triangle is the other thing that we look at. Um, we look at money management schemes, debt management schemes and practical support and referrals to other agencies who can support with that. 
support from family, uh, a lot of people who do choose to share um, their, their, their situation with their family members, or sometimes family can kick in and support where with money management and, and, and access to money type things to support them in their uh, goal set in there. Um, and there's also banking options where um, they can put um, uh, limits on their spends and credit card accesses to be able to use gambling through their banking. Um, various banks are involved in various schemes across the country, so that's a practical thing that can be applied. The um, emotional support side is where we start to look at offering a space to talk and be heard, so not necessarily um, having to do anything, but just being able to listen and being able to um, uh, hear what the individual is experiencing at that time, which is often sometimes all somebody is needing in, in that first contact with the helpline. Um, from that, we can then signpost to other support services. So that's across the UK and Northern Ireland. Uh, and we would encourage people to engage with services available in their localities. We also provide useful advice and information and that we, we can send emails out and links to um, to various tools and activities and just information, um, which is often um, the first step for somebody is to find out more about what um, they're experiencing and also uh, being able to signpost them to other kind of support services and mutual aid services um, like Gambling Anonymous and, 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 and things like that. And the other major thing that we do on the helpline is offer direct facilitated referrals to GAMCARE um, directly delivered services or our many partners across the country, across the partner network. So again, offering the person face-to-face um, -face interventions locally um, or online services, um, the choice is theirs really. So just wanted to touch on some of the barriers that um, people, that may be there for people to seek support and you may experience in some of the work that you do. So um, one of the key things that people talk about a lot is the shame of, 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 of the situation that they're in. Um, and that presents itself um, quite uniquely in, in the genders, I think, um, expectations around the gender roles. So uh, we, we get reports of our, our female um, cohort to say that they struggle to be able to engage in services because of the uh, perception that gambling is not um, a women's issue, it's a male issue and it's a male activity. Um, so just being able to kind of um, bring down some of those barriers around um, those stereotypes really. And also culture and religion um, play um, a, an impact on, on some of the shame uh, of why people report that they feel that they're not able to seek help. Um, fear, there's a lot of fear for people in seeking help. I think it's very similar um, in drugs and alcohol services um, uh, where you're kind of your first step um, in, in, see, in, in identifying that as a problem, acknowledging there's a problem and then seeking help. Um, and one of the things that people fear a lot is their confidentiality, people knowing uh, what's going on, if they've concealed it for, for some time as well, and just being able to be open and speaking about that in, in, in a different space. Um, we also get reports of people feeling um, they don't want to be criminalised for their behaviour. Um, some of the, some of the activity and, and what they've done to be able to secure funding to continue to gamble um, may have to be spoken about, and that creates a lot of fear in people being able to acknowledge that. Um, bringing up past trauma, uh, is another thing people kind of put a lid on things sometimes and don't want to open uh, those discussions. Um, so coming into a counselling type service means that for them or their fear is means that they have to go to places that they may not want to go to to explore this behaviour. Um, and a, a lot of the female cohort um, talked about the fear of going into treatment spaces that were predominantly male um, uh, and the male attitudes uh, within those uh, spaces. So again, looking at um, making sure that services are meeting um, needs of, of, of the different groups to be able to access and engage in services. Um, and awareness, you know, is one of the key barriers, I think, to people seeking support. If you don't know support is out there, how are you going to engage with it? Um, so, you know, raising the profile um, is, is one of the biggest things that I'm sure um, you will all experience in the work that you do. And, you know, getting, uh, reaching out to professionals like GPs um, who are able to ask a single question to be able to, people are not being asked the question or not being um, given the space to be able to discuss it, then, you know, 
the awareness is not there and, and they, they're not able to access the support that they may need. Um, I think the other thing that um, is a, a barrier is the limited academic evidence and research, especially in the, in the UK, um, is, is something that I think a lot of uh, academics are working on and, and trying to build that profile and, and build that evidence base. And I think that will only help uh, to be able to highlight um, what this issue is and, and, and support people to seek support. And again, I think I mentioned before, um, isolation, um, people uh, with a lack of awareness of it's not just me, um, there are others that have an experience the same as, as I do and feeling isolated, both as a gambler and an affected other, um, is, is, is a barrier to seeking support. Um, so, you know, being able to speak about it and raise awareness and be open to um, uh, accessing services is a key thing in the work. That so, um, I think I wanted to leave you with some practical, what could I do in the work that I do? And I'm sure there's a range of professionals on, on this call today. So um, I think this applies to, to, to all uh, professionals and all walks of life. Um, a brief intervention and a brief advice session could be done by anybody. Raising the profile of gambling, being able to ask the question is one of the key things that we're trying to um, promote uh, within GAMCARE. Um, so passing on gambling resources, uh, there are uh, resources available on the, on the GAMCARE website. Um, there's also a GAM test on, on, on the GAMCARE website where somebody can do a bit of a screening, it's a question tool, and they can plot their answers in and, and kind of see where they are in terms of getting a measure of their own behaviour uh, around their gambling currently. And, and, and obviously there's, there's resources there for um, them to be able to apply practical tools uh, immediately. Um, the other key thing, as I mentioned before, is referring to treatment services. Now, I am aware that we uh, gambling uh, and gambling specialist services specifically um, are not wide uh, ranging. You know, we, we are a small field, um, but we have a massive reach in terms of um, how small we are and, 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 and all the areas that we're in. Um, but I think, you know, identifying your local services, what support is available locally, what support is available nationally, whether that be online um, uh, interventions, but providing choice so that people can know what is available to them and being able to guide them to that. So the first point of call in, in all our interventions and all we do is the National Gambling Helpline because that is a national um, service that anybody can access. It's a free phone number. Again, that's open 24 um, um, seven and the advisors on the line will then guide the person to the locality um, and the services that are local to them that they can engage with. Um, and the other thing to highlight is the contact in your local training and engagement lead. So in all areas, we have um, a uh, training and engagement lead that will help to raise the profile. Uh, in Northern Ireland, we have a lady called Gillian, which I'm sure some of you or many of you would have come across um, at the moment. I will be um, putting her contact details in the chat so that you can take that down. Um, so if any of you would like to arrange a session for any awareness, please do make contact and we can arrange that for you. Uh, I think that is me, Gary. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that really good uh, presentation because there's great insight from a frontline provider perspective. Uh, please, if you've got uh, questions, uh, put them into the question and answer uh, feature um, available. Uh, we're going to take a wee break uh, just to give people a chance to take a comfort break. So it's 11.16 now. Uh, if we could uh, return, we'll, we'll begin sharp at uh, 11.25. Uh, so we'll just switch our cameras off here uh, and see us back at 11.25. Okay, uh, welcome back everyone. Um, we're going to go straight into our uh, next presentation. I'd like to introduce uh, Pauline Campbell. Uh, Pauline has been working with uh, WWE Addiction Services for the last 24 years um, as a counsellor and then as a manager, and now she is the director of the organisation. 
Uh, Dunleary is one of the longest established addiction services uh, in Northern Ireland and operates across uh, all of Ireland uh, and provides a, an Ireland-wide uh, gambling support service for adults. Uh, so very pleased to have you here, uh, Pauline. Uh, so I'll just hand over to you if you want to begin your presentation. Can you, can you see the presentation there all right, Gary? Yes, Pauline, yes. All right, right. Thanks very much, uh, Gary. I'm delighted to be here to present this webinar and to talk about Dunleary's Problem Gambling Treatment Service. Um, why is this not moving for me? Okay, so really, it's going to take me a wee, let's see this technology, Gary. It, it's taken me a wee while to get used to it all. Um, so really what I want to do today is look at who we are, who Dunleary is and what we offer. Um, our service user breakdown uh, from January 20 um, in that year are the impact of COVID-19 and how it's impacted on our service, cross addiction and most importantly, um, our service user perspective. And we have two very brave service users who agreed to be videoed and they talk about their recovery journey and the impact gambling has had on themselves, their families and their loved ones. Um, Dunleary Addiction, just a wee overview, Dunleary Addiction Service for, for people that don't know was formed as an independent charity in 1987. And since then, we've been providing counselling, mentoring and training for individuals affected by substance misuse and or problem gambling issues. Our mission statement, unlocking the door to personal growth, learning and change, represents our belief that everyone has within them the capacity to change and develop as unique individuals. In 2008, we received funding from the Irish Bookmakers Association to develop a service for individuals with problem gambling issues. Since then, we have been offering a client-focused counselling and mentoring service in a highly professional manner staffed by qualified counsellors. And we also operate a helpline service, which is free and runs 365 days per year. Most recently, we have developed training programmes to raise awareness of problem gambling um, and to equip other professionals with the knowledge and tools to enable them to recognise the signs and signpost clients appropriately. These courses are accredited by OCN at level one, two and three, and they're also CIPD UK certified. In 2019, we won a tender from the Gambling Awareness Trust, GAT, in the Republic of Ireland to fund this service. We all also received funding from Turk Guardians in Northern Ireland, all our services are delivered independently, targets are agreed with funders, and our services are directed by our company mission statement and values. I suppose I just wanted to touch a wee bit on the prevalence and in 2016, the rate of problem gambling in Northern Ireland was 2.3%. Um, and this followed on from a survey that was conducted in 2010, where it was 2.6%. So really no statistically significant difference. But compared to other regions of the United Kingdom, the proportion of population found to be problem gamblers is high in Northern Ireland, um, compared to Wales, which is 1.1, Scotland 0.7, and as Mark was saying in his presentation, England 0.5. The Republic of Ireland, the prevalence rate is 0.8% uh, based on a survey conducted in 2015. So stating that there's probably an approximately uh, 37,000 problem gamblers in Ireland. Now, many believe that this is an underestimate and an underestimation due both to the methodology employed and the advances in technology. Um, and it was really Maynooth University, this is where I'm getting these figures from. They done a, a research which Dunleary was involved in, um, and it's an interesting read. So from Dunleary's perspective, we feel there's a need for research to explain why the rate in Northern Ireland has been found to be higher. Um, 
as well as the need to coordinate research methods in different regions, different countries to pro provide accurate comparisons. It's difficult to compare. There's a need for strategy health providers to capture data on gambling prevalence to effectively identify uh, support needs. And I get this question asked quite a bit, uh, you know, is it because of the conflict in Northern Ireland uh, and is that the reason for a higher rate? Now, intergenerational trauma has impacted on mental health in Northern Ireland. And we feel as an organization, there's certainly further re research needed to examine this specifically relating to problem gambling. Um, we, we do get service users uh, disclosing that they're under a lot of pressure with loan sharks and um, paramilitaries. And um, so I, I really think it needs to be, it's an area that could be researched more in depthly. Also, I'm trying to focus on Northern Ireland as well. And thankfully, there was a consultation in 2019. And um, that consultation, there was over 400 responses. Um, and unlike the United Kingdom, um, which has a gambling commission, Northern Ireland does not. Now, we're the communities minister um, was quoted and said that gambling regulation had not kept pace with industry and technology changes. Um, it's clear from the consultation that people are content for some of the existing legal constraints on gambling to be relaxed. However, she added that the consultation showed the public believes that the government, the gaming industry and others need to do much more to prevent, control and combat, combat uh, problem gambling. And just recently there, the Irish government has passed amendments in its Gaming and Lottery Act. Um, and there's a, hopefully a significant overhaul of gambling legislation expected later this year. So all moving in the right direction. Uh, in the, the Republic of Ireland, we're talking about 35 years before um, we're re-looking at legislation. Um, so, Focusing on Dunleary then, um, our problem gambling treatment service is uh, counselling, advice and support for adults over 18 who are directly or indirectly affected by problem gambling issues and also for family members. Our referral pathways include our free helpline, self, family members, GPs, statutory and voluntary services. Um, our staff are professionally trained and are accredited are working towards accreditation. Fiona Geary is our gambling service coordinator, and we work with from a bank of sessional counsellors who are specifically trained in gambling awareness and our practitioner courses. Uh, the helpline is not open 24 hours at, uh, a night like Gamcur. Ours is open from 9 till 11, seven days a week, but it is open 365 days of the year. And uh, that's just the numbers for the free helpline. The service is free. Um, and it's, we offer six to 12 counselling sessions on a one-to-one -one basis with the possibility of an extension. Um, it's client-led with staggered endings. Um, we use a DSM-5 assessment and um, our cycle of change within addiction is extremely important where people are. And our door is always open. With the case of addiction, there are relapses and um, it's just that our service users know that they can come back to us. We have an outreach and aftercare program and uh, we have established referral pathways with GAMCAR, um, with GA, with q and um, with Axtern and also Gambling with Lives. Um, now I'm aware Gambling with Lives are actually launching a pilot education program today uh, with schools um, in the long gallery, so uh, it's it's good to hear that, that the prevention and work going into schools. Um, so we've got about COVID nineteen. It's impacted impacted us all, and I can't really talk about the service without mentioning it. Um, so in March two thousand and twenty, we moved from the provision of face to face counselling to a telephone and online support. 
Uh, it did impact on our gambling referrals. We found that they were low in the month of April, May and June. Um, um, we think that's due to lockdown and betting shops being closed and um, furlough. Um, but during the lockdown, some of our service users expressed relief and a sense of security with brickmaker shops and casinos being closed. Others have expressed isolation and fear. While some have opened up online accounts for the first time, others have relapsed when self-isolating with COVID. So we, we do feel it has impacted on, on our treatment service. Our, our service is Ireland wide um, and we have sessional counsellors in different counties uh, across Ireland. And this is just a wee uh, slide of uh, the map of Ireland and it's coloured in in purple because purple is the Louis colour. Um, and as you can see, this is uh, January 2020 to December 2020. We have had service users and referrals from the majority of every county in Ireland, Bar, Leitrim, Longford and Kerry. Now, that's not to say there isn't anybody with a problem gambling um, issue in any of those counties. It just may mean that we haven't done enough PR around there. Um, but we, every county has been touched the county with the biggest number of referrals is Belfast in Northern Ireland and goes without saying a capital city, Dublin, in, in the south of Ireland. Uh, I, again, I thought I'd take a snapshot of the year uh, and the figures. I don't want to overkill with statistics, but um, in January 2020 to Dece December 2020, there were 3,253 appropriate calls made to the helpline. Now, when I say appropriate, uh, we get inappropriate calls. And again, it's a bit like what Rachel said in her presentation. The calls are about what's the odds uh, on a horse at 3.30. Um, I'm, I can't get into my account um, uh, and stuff like that. But there were 3,253 appropriate calls. And 60% of the helpline calls resulted in brief interventions, uh, some advice, some support, some signposting. 26% of the helpline calls were made by family members seeking advice and support. 6% uh, were made by other professionals, um, including GPs, uh, bookmaker staff, and other voluntary and community organisations. And 8% of the helpline calls resulted in service users or, or family members engaging with the problem gambling counselling service. So they moved into the, the, the counselling service. In that year, there were 230 service users who engaged in the counselling process, 165 male, 65 female. Uh, the highest age range was 25 to 44 with 52% of service users. 65, um, 65 to, sorry, 45 to 64 was the next highest age range. And as you could see, 5% of service users were 65 and over. So before lockdown, 16% um, of our service users were betting on horses and brickmaker shops. Most activity all went online um, with the lockdown, uh, although online was increasing before lockdown as well. So 70% online betting and 20% online machines. With 3% uh, with issues with scratch cards, 3% issues with playing the lotto. Um, and in playing the lotto, they were playing it more than once a week. Um, and 3% had gambling issues with online bingo and 1% it was to do with the stock market. Over 80% found the counselling service to be very helpful, and we had a total of 153 learners who completed an OCN Level 1 Problem Gambling Awareness Training, and 47 learners completed OCN Level 2 and Level 3 Addressing Problem Gambling. So that was really good um, that training, for that training to be provided. So from 2008 um, to the current day, we have seen certainly an increase of online gambling. 
um, easy accessibility, not real money. Um, and when I was doing some research for, for this presentation, you know, Philip McGuigan, who's an MLA, was very open and very honest about his gambling addiction. Um, he, he talked about that it ruined many a Christmas and a birthday because of his gambling. His gambling was online poker. Um, he was able to gamble on his laptop, his iPad, on his phone. He always had access and he kept going until the money ran out. Um, so with his honesty, he was highlighting the online uh, gambling and how it kind of impact on not only himself, but on, on his family members as well. We've seen an increase of women availing of the service, um, particularly, and not to be stereotypical, but, but tip, particularly with online bingo, scratch cards and machines. With bingo, um, bingo is a social activity, uh, and that's what our women's service users are telling us. It's a social activity, but when they're in the bingo halls, and um, now that they're open again, um, the machines have a draw for them and, and they tend to have an issue with um, slot machines. And um, we've seen an increase of family members contacting the service. Family members can be severely affected by the problem uh, gambling behaviour of a loved one. Um, our service offers free support and counselling for family members and to anyone who's experiencing relationship difficulties, including loss of trust and feelings of betrayal, shame, burnout, stress, or financial problems. Um, we had one family member on at the weekend, um, uh, a gentleman in his late seventies, who had rang to find out whether or not his son had a gambling problem. He um, didn't know how to approach it, um, felt very overwhelmed by it. He had lent his son money and then had lent his son more money and really didn't know how to approach the subject, but really um, it was very overwhelmed and very distressing for him. So the, the support on the on the helpline was what he needed, what he needed and how to sign post on from there. We also have seen from 2008, obviously, an increase in young people human. Um, and we're hoping to work with our services over 18, and we're hoping to develop a programme for young people, particularly in relation to gaming. When I was speaking to Gary about what to talk about at this uh, presentation, it was about cross addiction, and um, I, I know Mark touched on it, on it in his presentation. Um, I suppose, from a Dunleary's point of view, we do see uh, service users who have had either an alcohol or a drug problem, and who have um, transferred their addiction. Um, Paul Merson was on uh, Good Morning Britain maybe about two weeks ago and he was talking about his alcohol and drug addiction. Now he was a former Premier League footballer and he had an alcohol and drug addiction. He went to therapy, he, he went through the talking therapies and um, he, he transferred his addiction onto a gambling addiction which made him feel like a crack addict and he lost control and it felt like insanity to him. But like our service users, it's often used as a way to fill a void that has been left by the original addiction. So about 20% of our service users uh, in our gambling service, uh, there's a cross addiction. But what I'm hearing very clearly is that around about 80%, it's solely and specifically a gambling addiction. There has no hasn't been any cross transfer over. Um, I suppose I really wanted to focus also on the individuals that come to our service. Um, particularly with gambling, they come to us at crisis point. Um, they find it very difficult to acknowledge that they actually have a problem, but 
because of debt and owing people money um, they are really at crisis and can find it very overwhelming they can be in a dark place and find it difficult to move forward um, there, there is suicidal ideology, it's been touched on previous presentations there, but this month alone there's been a number of clients who've been referred to our service after attempting to take their own lives. Um, service users tell us about the whole secrecy, the mistrust, um, they're in denial, um, manipulation of the truth, there's a lot of games played, um, the relationships are impacted. Um, and they come to us, they've not been through the system, which unlike people with alcohol and drugs, they may go to their GP, they may go to uh, AA, they uh, may go through the community addiction team. Um, majority of service users that come to us with a problem gambling um, issue are coming to us for the first time. The first time they've had the courage to take, lift up a phone and ask for help. Very little knowledge of self-exclusion and how you can go about uh, and, and self-exclude. You know, we certainly refer on to the lack of GAM staff and GAM ban. Um, Danska Bank um, has, um, you can instantly block transitions to a licensed gambling merchant for, and it takes uh, 72 hours for your card uh, to lift that block. We have trained credit union staff, we have trained, Donna has trained bookie staff um, to recognise the signs of problem gambling and also to signpost. Um, and wear masks. But look, we to tell you something, I could talk all day here about our gambling service. I could, uh, I need more than 30 minutes to do it. Um, I just know that it's needed. I need. I know the professional help is needed for, for people and our service users, I think, can say it a lot better than what I can. Um, so I'm going to present these two uh, videos. Geraldine, very brave woman, um, has had a gambling problem with slot machines. Um, and she's going to talk here about how gambling has impacted on herself, her family and her recovery journey. She was able to hold down a job and a normal life, whatever normal life is, means. Um, and her gambling was a way to deal with her anxiety. So. Yeah, gambling affected my life in a big, big way. Um, I would say it was more of a loss. And I, I turned to gambling because of things happened to family. Sure. The loss of my mother, my father having Alzheimer's. It makes sound like an excuse, but I was just going and playing slot machines, and just I was in a world of my own, and nothing else mattered. Nobody mattered, not even my husband. And I was just going and playing the machines, and I was just lost in that world, and nothing else mattered. And sure, sure, what does it matter? Sure, nobody cares about me, you know. But it was self, you know, it was the only person that was hurting was myself, but I didn't realise that. I just couldn't. I was out of control, I just, my mind was, I couldn't focus on nothing, I wasn't, I just couldn't focus, I just, my whole anxiety and I just, I was so low, I just felt so low at the lowest point that I could, and I said, like, I can't, I was so low, I couldn't, I couldn't go anywhere else, I was either going down and I would have been dead or else, I had to take a choice and fight for my life, and that's just, and affect every day and you know thankfully I'm a strong person you know thankfully for the help from your services I've got counselling for six months reach out for help don't uh, it'll destroy you you know the nigga you know it'll always be it'll it's like a devil on your shoulder mm -hmm. so it is um it'll keep chipping away at you you know it'll take everything from you mm -hmm. if you let it mm -hmm. and if you don't fight for your life you know it is, there's no way out of it. If you don't ask for help, you don't get help and get good friends around you. A good support network is what you need and get telephone numbers of people. If you're feeling like if you're going to gamble, no, lift the phone to someone. 
even it's just a couple of words to say, you know, I'm here mm -hmm. if you need me, you know, um, say if someone said, like, I feel like doing something today, I'm trying not to, you know, don't think about no, how far you've come, don't put yourself down, you know, it might be, say, a week, a couple of days, you know, every day is a triumph. I just, I can't believe how much I've turned my life around, I really can't. I uh, pray to God and keep me safe going to sleep and, you know, thankful that I have my family still around me. And first, the 19th of May, 2019 was the last time I gambled and that's when my life started to change and turn around and um, I'm thankful that I'm still here and I'm thankful that I've got my life back. Thanks for this opportunity, so like, even if it helps one person to stop gambling, I'm just happy that I could contribute and help. Um, the next video is Adrian, again, a very courageous young man. Um, and it's very clear from Adrian's video that he has no choice. Uh, he was completely taken over by his compulsive gambling. And um, I'll just play it now. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> um, and all honestly, I was, I died, you know, I, I started off as a oh, couple of pound here, a couple of pound there, escalated, and I'm no different to any other gambler, this big one, this big one, you know, every single gambler, it's the same as any addiction, everybody's got a trigger, you know, you need to, I was struggling to find what my trigger actually was, I just want it. Oh, I want. Oh, I want a fancy car. Right? I want the money for that. Oh, I want a holiday. I want the money for that. Oh, I, 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 I get caught in this moment where this big one was going to be mine. Um, the further and further I went into it, um, I lost jobs over the head of it. I was sitting on top of our, you know, up on roofs. So I was meant to be doing work. And I was sitting gambling. And, you know, I was sitting and going gambling. Like my phone was never out of my hand. So I lost a couple of jobs, and I just kept. I, I forgot who I was. I died as a person myself. I didn't exist anymore. I was this new person, and this person was self-centered. This person, you know, nobody. The only person in the world that mattered to this person was him. I lost count of how many times I actually said I get help. Um, so I, I kept escalating and escalating and until I got to the stage where I was. I wasn't sleeping. I was. Going onto my bed, nine o'clock, I had lost any good friends I had like, that I could re rely on, I had lost them. I had either borrowed money off them, or stole something, or I had... The person who they were friends with wasn't there anymore, so they didn't like this new person. This was me, this was my new life, and this was what I was going to do. And that's just... It's, it's really, really, really difficult. The impact that it does... To lose yourself so much, you know, it's like falling down, you know, a lot, the largest mountain, but realizing you need to try and get back up there again, mm -hmm. and you look at it and you have the energy and you think, no way, I can't get back up there. So you just remain where you're at. You know, I had two or three attempts at taking my own life due to debt. Um, did I want to die? No. I want to help. I think that's what, the, what a big, big, big part of it is. You know, the gambler, he impacts everybody. Every single person he touches, every person he's near, that you, you impact their life in some way. The gambling me was, was there, and then I had now changed myself out of this. The other person who was fighting this, who was determined, who was, you know, talking to anybody that was willing to listen, um, you know, getting involved in different things, and, and I thought, yeah, this is me. So I created a whole new life for myself. You know, I, I got back in love with my family again. I brought my family closer to me again. Uh, I brought my children closer to me. You know, my wife was always by my side. I, I wouldn't, you know, honestly be here today if it wasn't for her. So, 
so so hard it's I I love the person I am now my point is you know everybody thinks well once you drop the gambling life's just perfect it's not you know you have this you see, the, it's the building the life again as the, as the hard part for me that's not saying oh I'm not going to bed tonight that's that's simple but it's waking up the next morning and knowing that you have to face the world again as yourself instead of hiding behind this mask stop don't do it for your mum don't do it for your dad don't do it for your family do it for yourself you can climb that mountain again you can get to the top and anybody who wants any help or needs to talk you know to Louis there there's you know left the phone there is a life beyond it but it's not easy don't go into it half hearted don't go into it thinking can I do this be yourself just go and say I can do this and do other things you know get things that's not um, you know, start supporting a football team or, or playing bowls or pick a sport and go and play something as a hobby and build your new life around that and I keep looking in the mirror and saying and enjoying the new person that you are instead of being that that old person who you don't want to be anymore and you can do it So I, I'm sure you will agree with me that they were both powerful testimonies from Geraldine and Adrian and there's nothing more I can say that can strengthen what they have said. However, I do want to reiterate the services that are available, the free helpline um, phone, the counselling, the training, the mentoring, the advice, the support, the aftercare. I think Adrian and Geraldine have illustrated very well the effects of problem gambling and how devastating and destructive problem gambling can be for individuals and families. Their stories also show us that with the right professional help and support, lives and trust can be rebuilt and that there's always, always hope. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Pauline. I'm sure you'll agree with three very good uh, presentations that really generated uh, a lot of thought and you know uh, questions coming through. Um, this is an opportunity now to kind of to, to discuss uh, some of those. Um, the, f the first one is um, we've had a few kind of comments around the same same kind of question, which is really uh, first one from Cynthia Curry, uh, really around. You know, is there a relationship between uh, gambling uh, addiction and uh, socioeconomic factors? Um, I know that within drug and alcohol, um, um, the drug and alcohol field, that you know that um, there, there isn't so, so much a an issue around um, that people are, are drinking and using drugs similarly across all different kind of regions but that the impact is disproportionately high within areas with of deprivation and where there's socioeconomic factors or in the harms and is that a, is that a similar uh, situation in, uh, in terms of gambling in an answer yes <laughs> yeah i mean obviously we know things like the younger you are the more like i mean i've, I mean, I've written two books on adolescent gambling obviously um we know that that kind of most addictions kind of peak between the 16 to 25 year old age group but obviously we know that minors um even for gambling are, are more susceptible um but you know i I'm, i come from a, a very eclectic approach and it's quite clearly not just about socio demographics you know gambling companies have responsibility for how they advertise and market you know some people might say they shouldn't be advertising in the first place but that's obviously a situational factor and has policy implications there is the structural characteristics at the in, you know the the gaming operators designing their games to be problematic and of course what i was trying to say in my talk is that there are <clears throat> loads of internal factors of which socio demographic variables are you know can play a huge part so um but you know what i would say is that what we're seeing now is obviously we're seeing more and more women come into gambling we've now got you know more and more older people gambling i mean those kind of what what we you know traditionally you would have seen gambling as a very male kind of middle-aged activity but it's kind of spreading right across now uh, across all the socio-demographic um variables so 
But the answer to your question is yes, quite clearly, sociodemographic variables play a part. And obviously, the, the more deprived you are and the poorer that you are, that is a risk factor for problem gambling. It doesn't mean that everybody who is deprived is going to be obviously develop a gambling problem, but it is a risk factor. Any other contributions around that? I guess I would just add in terms of um, the demographics that I displayed in my presentation, we are still very much um, dominated by one ethnic group in terms of those accessing services. And as I mentioned in, in the presentation, I don't think that um, uh, gambling is specific to uh, white British population. I just think that there's different ways of, of, of connecting with different communities who may also uh, be experiencing uh, gambling related harms. And, and there's some work for us to do as services and academics to kind of get underneath that a bit to explore that further. So um, I think, yeah, the, 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 there's definitely, I think, I think all the need for more research and uh, more data gathering around uh, this particular agenda to be able to really understand especially particular areas uh, for, for, for particular people so um, I think we've given you a bit of a, a snapshot uh, if you like today but there's definitely more work to be done. And in your presentation um, Ray, you, you had less than 20 percent of the, the the people who were defined as, as, as gamblers were female. Um, yet the industry seems to be, you know, more proactive around targeting um, females and moving towards how the kind of the targets um, uh, by gender. Uh, is there are, are there issues there in terms of, you know, the the, the the how the trends are going around, you know, um, particular groups being targeted. By the, in, by the industry proactively, but how that translates then to how you deal with that kind of, you know, I suppose that that, that delay in in those in those groups, you know, get to the point where or being able to, to seek help. And are there barriers that perhaps in terms of how services are set up, which are factors there? Uh, we we secured some funding from uh, the tampon tax uh, a few years ago to have um, targeted programs, uh, the women's program. Um, uh, running nationally across across um, England and uh, the work that work in particular over the last a couple of years has, has identified some significant um, barriers and gaps to people accessing services or coming forward or identifying themselves um, uh, as, as needing to support services but I, I, you're absolutely right Gary it's kind of we're, we're, we're running alongside the industry or promoting more and more to particular groups and therefore we, we need to have a targeted approach in the same way as how we raise awareness with those groups to be able to um, support in any way that we can. So um, I think, again, going back to kind of the way and the nature we collect data and how we use that um, is, is a key factor, um, I think, to that. And as this agenda is not sitting under a kind of strategically under a health kind of uh, banner, if you like, it, 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 there's more work that we have to do as services and as academics in this field to be able to kind of do more around those trends and then being able to to target uh, what we need to target but yes we do we do try our best to counteract if you like um some of some of that um targeted advertising from from the industry okay so, um uh, we've got a question from uh, nelson davis she's asking i think it's directed towards you mark Around, in terms of your, your definition of addiction, is recovery possible? And what does that look like? Um, is it the absence, absence of gambling or is it a, is it harm reduction? Um, well, I, okay, so, sorry, what was the first question again about the recovery, sorry? Well, is, I suppose, well, the question is, is recovery possible? Yeah, the answer is yes, the recovery is definitely possible. You know, I've, I've worked in this field for nearly 35 years now. And it's always lovely to see people come out the other side and not be gambling. I mean, there'll, there'll always be those people, particularly if you come from a more kind of 12 step approach, will say that, you know, once you're a problem gambler, you're always a problem gambler and <clears throat> that's always with you. Um, but we know that addictions across across the piece do tend to mature out as you get older. Uh, as I say, there are peak times when addiction is is, is more prevalent. Um, I mean, the other thing about addictive personality, that's one of the things that I was trying, you know, 
one of the things I didn't, sorry, one of the things I didn't mention about addictive personality is if you believe in the concept of addictive personality, you're basically saying I can never be cured. And of course, because I don't believe in the concept of addictive personality, I'm saying you can, you know, you can get over and get, you know, recover from that um, in the long run. And what was the second part to that? There was a, wasn't there a corollary you said after the recovery bit? Uh, well, uh, the, the question was around whether recovery was uh, not gambling or whether it was a reduction in gambling. All right. Okay. So again, got, obviously I come from a, now, if you work in the drugs and alcohol field, you would probably argue that the, the, the approach that's, you know, that's dominated the last 50 years has been an abstinence based approach. Whereas I come from a behavioral addiction side and I think it's unreasonable to say to an exercise addict, to a work addict, to um, a shopping addict, you can't do these activities again. You know, so really it's about getting the behavior under control rather than the behavior being abstinent. And I think there's a lot that the, if you like, the, the drug world can learn from the behavior addiction side, because I'm somebody that do believe that, um, you know, if you look at the studies on control drinking, there are some people who have been alcoholics and they get back to a level of controlled drinking. I mean, it's very controversial. Not everybody could do that. But for me, it's about harm minimization and, and control rather than complete abstinence. OK, thank you. Anybody else want to comment on that? I, I would agree with Mark, I think. Um, I, I think also um, when we talk about person-centered approaches to somebody's recovery, somebody's treatment interventions, person-centered means that the person is, is, is directing what they want. They're setting their goals. We're supporting them to meet those goals. Um, if we are dictating the goal or what that should be in abstinence is the goal, then I think we, we remove some of that from the individual to make more informed choices for, for themselves on where their journey is. You know, you might have somebody who, who begins to think about controlled use and as part of their recovery journey then you know moves on to abstinence being for them the right the, the right goal and the right choice but I don't think as services and, and, and providers we should be we, we kind of dictating that I think it should come from the individual in a very person-centered way yeah I think I think within certainly Northern Ireland anyway within drug and alcohol services that there is much more of a focus on harm reduction than abstinence is now because um, you know, it's how you define progress. You know, progress for each individual can be, you know, small, very, very small steps uh, forward. Uh, and um, some of the questions coming through are around, you know, you know what, are, what are the effective approaches um, towards supporting people with, with, uh, with problem gambling issues? Um, and you know, what are the pathways? I've got a question here from Jarvin Phillips. Uh, what are the pathways to help gamblers and how do they assist psychological change in the gambler? Would anyone like to, to respond to that? Well, I'm not a treatment specialist. So I don't necessarily feel I'm the right person to answer that. But I mean, I go, I, I go with what um, Ray was saying about you have got to fit the treatment to the individual. And so, you know, in terms of pathways, you have to be led by the client, um, you know, so, but yeah, I'm not, I, I don't treat, I've never tr treated a gambler in my life. So, you know, I'm talking about what I, you know, what I read and what other people tell me. So, I mean, I think um, Ray's in a much better position to say, you know, to answer that particular question than me. Gary, our counsellors would certainly use an integrative approach um, and focus on CBT uh, therapy with, with uh, problem gamblers. Um, so different, different counselling um, therapies and models will be used depending on the need of the client that comes through the door. I mean, one thing I would add from a, an academic's perspective <clears throat> is that there is no one treatment Mm. <clears throat> apart from maybe in terms of effectiveness cbt probably just edges it but all the research says is that a multimodal approach is the best approach to treating gamblers and that obviously people will say that they they benefit from talking cures pharmacotherapy 
that you know it, it isn't a case of one size fits all i mean i come from a cbt background um and i'm obviously i'm a, I'm a big adherent of cbt and most of the people i know use cbt in their their gambling treatment but it's not used exclusively to the you know people will say i enjoy attending ga meetings because i can talk with other like-minded people i like talking to my individual counselor one-to-one -one. i like the fact that my doctor gives me prozac or other antidepressant drugs to to to, to try and get you know minimize the urges to gamble and to, to get over my problems so it, it you know, multimodal treatment is definitely, you know, the, the more integrated something is and the more you fit it to the individual, the more successful it's going to be. But the idea that there is one single treatment that is better than, you know, another single treatment, I, I think is a bit of a myth. Um. I guess in terms of pathways, um, there will be different pathways for different cohorts. Uh, I, I, um, for GAMCARE as a national provider, we have services that are targeted at young people uh, from, from age 10 to 18. We then have adult services from 18 upwards. We have uh, services that work with affected others who are affected by somebody else's uh, gambling behaviours. Um, we also work with parents who are affected by young people's behaviour changes around uh, gaming and, and gambling. So there are different pathways for, for those different types of cohorts accessing services. Um, we, we work in the same way as, as Pauline and, and we use a combination of approaches, what we call psychosocial approaches, which could be anything from motivational interviewing techniques, very similar to what you would use in drug and alcohol, right through to, as, as Mark said, that, you know, the edged one, which is CBT. So depending on person's presentation um, and what their needs are, I think I alluded in one of my slides to some of the practical things that we can apply as well. So it's not just about the talking therapies and the uh, interventions on that side. It's about the practical things that people can do around money management, applying blocking software and exclusion things. So it, it's it's each care plan is tailored to the individual needs, what they're presenting with. And then we would offer a range of, of, of things that they could um, apply and engage with to be able to um, start working towards their recovery. I think one of the key things, and, and I guess links to this talk today, is we are very keen to work in a, in a much more care coordination approach, because as we know, especially since COVID, people are um, uh, accessing services with much more complex needs, with a, a range of needs around not one particular issue, but a, a range of issues from mental health to housing to debt, to gambling and, and, and other addictions. So therefore working with our addiction colleagues across other disciplines and health and social care professionals in, in, in other areas is, is a key to looking at that holistic approach and not just being siloed in looking at one thing for any individual. And yeah, um, I mean, I think that all frontline services would, would say the same thing, that you know, the, the people that are coming through their door are coming with more complicated kind of you know, complex issues or, you know, at points of crisis as opposed to at early stages of, of developing uh, problems. Uh, and, you know, I think today's been really useful around being able to, to show the services and supports that there are there, which are specific to, to gambling. But um, there's a larger population, I'm sure, of, of people who are not getting connected into services or specialist services for gambling. But are engaged with other other services where these these issues are present. So, is there any any kind of uh, advice or anything you'd say around how people who are already working with um, uh, with people where gambling may be present as one of the factors or one of the issues, but what they can do? We're really promoting at the moment other professionals using kind of a single screening question as part of their own core assessment functionalities. So every every uh, discipline will have an assessment framework that they work in to be able to identify needs and identify if, if people are working in a strengths-based approach, they will be looking at what skills and abilities people have um, present and, and, and what they support services can support with. And I think one of the key things that we're trying to promote is other professional disciplines asking the question, because at the moment it's quite vacant. There's, you know, gambling is not considered, other things uh, are considered a lot more um, and I you know from my experience of working in drugs and alcohol many years ago um, it, we had the same kind of um, thing with trying to get drugs and alcohol in on some of these other uh, professional radars so I think it's the same for, for gambling now we, we would like professionals to start kind of really thinking about asking um, a, a question that may trigger and elicit people to speak a bit more about their behaviours around gambling which they may not um, divulge without those questions being asked. 
Um, so um, yeah, I think something that all professionals could really look at is how can you ask um, some basic questions or one basic question as part of your um, normal assessment to be able to, to, to assess if somebody is needing a specialist services for gambling. And Gary, we have created a, a, a card that um, anybody can read and uh, decipher whether they have an issue with gambling. Um, you know, we, we asked in the card if uh, they've bet more than they can afford to. Um, have they gone back another day to, to win back the money they've lost? Uh, have they borrowed money or stole money to gamble? Do they feel guilty about the way they gamble? Do they experience health problems such as stress, anxiety, and or have they been affected by someone else's gambling? And by ticking the boxes, there's a self-assessment as to whether or not there is a, a, a problem with gambling. Um, and these wee cards are in credit unions, banks, statutory and voluntary organisations as well. Um, so it's like a self-assessment. Well, that's very helpful. I and mean, I think I think there's definitely something to being able to, to have something built into the, the, the screening uh, mm -hmm. as well for services so that actually these issues aren't been you know, passed by. Um, is there anything that, around how, how, you know, most of the people who are engaged with services as I say get to the, get to the, get come to the services at the point where things have gotten really really difficult and really bad. Uh, and we've also, uh, as uh, Mark has uh, talked about, uh, you know, we've got a, an increase in young people uh, who uh, are gambling. Uh, is there anything, any thoughts around what, where we should be going around taking a more preventative approach or an, er an earlier intervention approach towards re reaching people at an earlier stage or preventing the problem in the first place? Well, as I said in my presentation, gambling with lives are having a pilot, they're producing a pilot prevention education um, program that's going into schools. And I think it's really important that the preventative within schools at a young age, you know, if we take the like of the, the gaming and screen, screen time and the increase of it, and, you know, we have parents ringing up um, not knowing whether or not to take the laptop away or whether to restrict the time on it. Um, so there's training for, for parents, there's training for and preventative work with young people in schools, I think definitely needs to happen. Um, and also, like, for example, China, they have decided to bring in a law that they can only, their young people can only be on screen for three hours in a week or something like that. So preventative work, educational work, all extremely important. But then, as I've said in my presentation, individuals come to us not when they're winning, um, but when they have lost money, when they are at rock bottom, they are crisis and the treatment and professional supportive um, organisations um, is e extremely important. Can I, I'll just say a few things, Gary, because uh, obviously I've got a longitudinal perspective on this. You know, I wrote my first book on adolescent gambling back in 1995. Uh, and one of the good things that's happened over the last, particularly over 25 years, actually, is that the, you know, youth gambling in terms of problem gambling has actually gone down. You know, back in the year 2000, for instance, the prevalence rates of problem gambling are around about 5% for young people. Now they're actually below 2%, which is still two or three times higher than adults uh, and is still, a, you know, of a concern. But you've got to ask yourself, and it just, just ties in what's just being sent, uh, sorry, what's just being said, is because I don't just work in the gambling sphere. I work on things like social media addiction, video game addiction, gambling addiction. And it's quite obvious now in terms of parents who get in touch with me is that gambling is not actually really on their radars anymore. I think 15 years ago, it was more on their radar, but now excessive social media use, excessive gaming are the things that parents do have real concerns about because they see the effects that it's having on their children's education or their children's physical education. And gambling has kind of slipped under the radar a bit there. But of course now with video gaming, we're getting companies who are monetizing their gaming products by bringing in gambling-like elements. So things like loot boxes, microtransactions, 
these are the you know what we're seeing and I, <clears throat> people think that gambling gaming convergence is a new thing i wrote my first paper on gambling and gaming converged in 1991 that was 30 years ago i was writing about this convergence but now we're really seeing it in a way that does actually you know where parents are actually realizing is that when they're buying FIFA cards for their children online and when they're buying loot boxes, these are things that really are, you know, they are gambling in anything but word. OK, and I do think we, you know, that we have to a regulate this. And obviously the Gambling Commission are well aware of, you know, these gambling like products that are out there now. But we, you know, in terms of social media, gaming and gambling, these are all converging now through the screen. And I look at my own, I, I mean, my three children are now all young adults. But none of my three children have ever known a world without the Internet, without smartphones. You know, and this is, you know, this is the way screen agers live their young lives now. I mean, every week without fail, I get an email from a parent who says that my daughter's addicted to social media or my son's addicted to gaming. And when I ask them why they think that, almost an, it's almost a, a carbon copy answer I get is because they say, because my child is spending three or four hours a day doing this activity. And I have to write back and say, well, we psychologists have got a word for that. It's called normal. And, you know, the thing is, is that many, many parents are pathologizing behavior because they're, they're doing, you know, children are doing activities that parents would rather than not be doing. But again, I look at my, you know, what, what was I doing when I was my kid's age? And I have to admit, I was watching three or four hours of black and white television every day with my parents at some five o'clock through to, to when I went to bed. You know, once I'd done my homework, that's what I did. My children don't watch TV anymore. Yeah, they watch a bit of stuff on YouTube, bit of catch up TV, but you know, that being on social media, gaming and doing things, that is what other young people do. And parents mustn't, you know, the, the answer about, you know, the screen time argument, okay, that for me is a null and void argument. It's not about the amount of hours, it's to do about the content and context of what you're doing on the screen. I mean, you know, unfortunately, I spend probably at least 10 hours a day in front of a screen. It's not about the number of hours and that's not the, you know, it's not the same for children either. But we've got to realize that gambling is one of those activities now where when young people are coming through now, is they're more likely to do it online than doing it in an offline environment. When I was a kid, you know, I was gambling on a slot machine at the amusement arcade. My kids don't do that. If they're going to, when they, you know, when they're starting gambling now, they are doing online sports bets my oldest son he's really into sports betting now and he's obviously he's, he's i don't i think he said he's never been to a bookmaker in his life everything is done through the smartphone and that's what we've got to realize now is that people get in a ferrari about another betting shot opening in the high street but i'm sorry if you're if you've got a smartphone you're walking around with a casino or a book, book a bookmakers in your back pocket or in your handbag you know the culture of gambling has totally changed OK, now the good news is that problem gambling doesn't seem to have actually significantly increased at all over the last two decades. But we are seeing different types of gambling problems now. So obviously we've got, you know, online gambling, which isn't a type of gambling, because obviously you can do lots of different types of, of gambling online. But also we're seeing, you know, in-play sports betting. I mean, that's gone from nowhere to something that's very, very big. And we know in terms of problem gambling, there is a much higher association within play betting than many other forms of gambling. And again, that's to do with the structural characteristics of, you know, sports betting, because 20 years ago, if you wanted to gamble on something sports wise, you would literally go in on a Saturday and bet whether your team was going to win or lose. It was a very discontinuous form of gambling. But now, of course, with online in play gambling with 60 or 70 markets on every single football game. And if you're anything like me, who's a massive sports fan who sits down on a Sunday afternoon and watches three matches on Sky back to back, that's six hours of possible continuous in play betting doing that. And of course, football's on every single day. You know, tonight with the Champions League, there'll be matches on from six o'clock through till 10. You know what you know the, the culture of sports gambling has completely changed the type and ways that people can do it has changed and the fact that we can now do it with 24 7 accessibility through our smartphone is also something that is of concern but as i say the good news is is that it doesn't seem to have been a, a you know any significant increase in problem gambling rates at least in england okay it's pretty it's remained pretty much at that half a percent now for for many many years but the types of gambling that people are getting into problems with 
has definitely changed. And as Ray was saying in her presentation, you look at the gambling call helplines, it's more and more about the gambling being online than it is offline. Of course, the pandemic has definitely had an effect in putting, you know, I, I, I do almost 100% of my shopping online now, even food shopping. And that has really come about as, a, as the pandemic. And of course, that has affected other things, including shopping in general, but also things like gambling. I think it's worth me highlighting as well, Gary, that um, I'm aware that Gambling With Lives are launching their, their work, their programme in schools, but GamCare have been de delivering you know, young people's work in Northern Ireland and across the, the UK uh, since last year. So we, we already have um, uh, young people's workers working in schools and delivering educational programmes. We also have um, a pathway from that um, work into the GamCare youth support services. So we also offer um, services in the same way as we do for adults, specifically for gambling for young people from the age of 10 to 18. And, and those services, what we're, what we're hearing from that, because we also work with concerned parents. So similar, just picking up on what Mark was saying about, you know, the parents' anxiety going up, especially since COVID and, and, and the kids spending more time on screen. Uh, and some of the things that we're, we're hearing and experiencing is that parents are more concerned about the behavior changes in their children as a result of more time um, uh, engaging in, in, in the screens. And I think it's more around and what, what's being presented is the social interactions. Um, when young people and, and, and again the pandemic has, has created that you know and for me I've got four children and, and I allowed my children to have time on screens during the, 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 the COVID period because they were engaging with friends as well because they can engage with friends on these uh, technology things now so for me it was better to allow them to engage and still have that communication than to not let them have any contact at all so it's it's about that whole you know measuring things what works for you what works for your family and and, and how you can support that but we, we also offer those services and have done for for some time now so if anybody is interested in those um intervention services please do contact Gillian I think she's put her, her, her contacts in the chat there okay thanks and we'll, we'll send out the details of both organizations whenever we're um sending our information out following the event as well um we're almost out of time um, and been, you know, a great kind of dis discussion, great presentations, uh, and we're getting lots of, uh, of, of questions. So I mean, we could we could do this for for longer. Um, any, but I want to give an opportunity for for you guys as the the, the panelists. Any final words that you would like to uh, to share with us before we, before we close? I just think that I'm, I'm hoping that this webinar, thank you, Gary, for putting this on and thank you for, for inviting us in. It's been really um, useful, but I do hope this has kind of sprung to mind for many of you professionals on, on the webinar, how you can potentially um, identify, question, you know, ask the questions and support people with engaging with services um, that specialise in, in this area um, because we, we are here to help. So hopefully um, that message got across. Uh, just to reiterate what Rachel has said, um, I, I just hope that if people are in crisis, uh, they know the helpline number, they know that there's help and support out there. I know some people ring the helpline uh, with GAMCAR, but we have a referral pathway in place that they're, if they're from Northern Ireland, GAMCAR actually contact us um, and we work very well together. But it, it's just to know that a lot of people don't know that the support is there um, and it's just really important that they're aware of helpline numbers and, you know, and not fall into the stigma of shame or that, that um, how, there's a lot of shame and stigma involved around someone having a gambling problem and a lot of secrecy. And it's just the, take the courage, like Geraldine and like Adrian, take the courage, lift the phone, get help. And there is recovery, and there and there is there is hope. Fine. Mark, the end before we before we close. No, I've got no words of wisdom to end on. I, I mean, from my perspective, if I die tomorrow, one of the things that I'm very proud of is that I, I co-founded Gamcare back in 1997. Uh, obviously, I was the chair of the trustees until 2004, and it's just an absolute joy to see where GAMCARE has gone from when Paul Bowring and I set it up all those many, many years ago to, to where it is now. 
um, you know, when we first set up the, the National Gambling Help, te Telephone Helpline, I don't think any of us could have envisaged where GamCare has got today. GamCare is, is well known all throughout the world now. Um, you know, and I, I'd like to take, you know, some of the, you know, kind of success and say that it was, I'm not saying it was all down to me, but, you know, we had this idea many, many years ago. In fact, it was in 1991 that we formed what was called the Young, Young, UK Forum on Young People and Gambling, which then morphed into, into GamCare in 1997. So, you know, it's great to see, you know, Ray here promoting GamCare. And I'm not even sure Ray knew that, you know, that I was one of, you know, one of the two co-founders many, many years ago. But as I say, if I die tomorrow, GamCare is one of the legacies that I'm really going to be very happy in terms of what I contributed to this world. Thank you. And on that note, uh, just to leave for me to, to, to thank uh, Mark and Ray and Pauline for their you know, great contributions into this uh, debate. I think you know the, the, the comments in the chat show uh, that you know that people have, have found it really uh, interesting and illuminating, and, uh, and uh, it's it's a beginning of of an ongoing kind of you know, debate that, that needs to continue to, to, to happen.